very respected colleagues. Thank you for having. Please. Okay, thank you again for your time and uh, to respond uh, to invitation of the organizer to participate uh, uh, in a session dedicated to the status <coughs> of the social science uh, in the area of fourth, fourth uh, industrial revolution. And uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Goran Basic. I'm director of the Institute of Social Science and uh, we have paid great attention to the topic of the position of the future of the social science in a recent year. And uh, today I hope that we will talk about uh, uh, this issue and the many others which are dedicated to the social si and humanist uh, humanistic science uh, in the contemporary world. And uh, uh, but uh, before the discussion in which uh, we will uh, all participate, uh, uh, we will hear brief 10 minutes uh, uh, presentation by colleagues uh, uh, Dan Molnar from the Faculty of Economics uh, of University of Belgrade, Paul Spearings from the uh, Ministry of the Infrastructure and Water Management of the Netherlands, and Professor Branko Rošević from Faculty, Faculty of Economics, uh, also from University of uh, Belgrade. Finally, uh, I will say something about the position of the social sciences and humanities in the modern world, as organized, organizers asked me. But given that uh, we have one hour and four panelists, uh, I will just uh, briefly make uh, a few, uh, for me, important uh, notes about the social science uh, in uh, uh, and uh, I started that in the case we want to summarize uh, the position of social sciences and uh, humanities and education in the digital age, we can uh, uh, do so by uh, quoting uh, Martin Luther uh, uh, King words. He said, our scientific power was outrun our spiritual power. We have guided uh, missiles and misguided men. In contemporary context, education keeps up what development of technology and requirements of the society does primarily trying to provide a high level of professional professionalism and uh, qualification of workers in performing certain jobs. Uh, the capability of critical thinking and analytical stance towards social uh, issue are neglected. Man has forgotten about the importance of education for self-esteem since while uh, profiting from material goods he needs to be careful and protect himself from their tyranny. If he is weak enough to uh, grow smaller, to uh, fit himself to the covering, then it becomes a process of gradual suicide by shrinking of the soul, as Tagora said. Another line of thinking regarding to the relationship between social sciences and education in the digital age concerns the education in civic competencies uh, and democracy, EA, uh, nurturing and development of critical thinking. Uh, however, many a critical oriented author uh, as American philosopher Martha Nussbaum believes that we are facing a global crisis of education, the crisis which undermines the fundamental values of modern society. Being dedicated to increasing their national profits, modern states in their education systems discard the skills necessary to keep a democracy alive. 
Should this trend persist, soon the entire world will witness the production of useful machines rather than competent citizens who use their own minds, criticize traditions and modern society, and understand the importance of other people's uh, suffering and achievements. The future of democracy is uncertain. In general, the attention is uh, increasingly paid to education in the context of its contribution to economic growth. Profit motivates governments and companies to invest uh, in development of uh, uh, natural sciences and technologies, as uh, these are believed to be crucial for the stability of a state and progress. The investments into development of technology are not a matter of dispute, but what is worrying is a possibility to neglect on the wings of the progress, uh, the development of skills uh, that are essential for the vitality of the, any democracy, as well as for the certain uh, of the cre creation of the sustainable world's uh, culture capable to construct and engage in solving global problems as pollution, climate changes, forced migration, populism of xenophobia. These skills are con uh, connected to social sciences, humanities, and art. The capability of critical thinking, the ability to overcome the local and in the area of globalization, to consider global problem as a citizen of the world, and finally, the ability to use one's empathy and understand the uh, adversities faced by the other people. We can already sense the tensions occurring between the concepts of education intended for making profit and education with the purpose of achieving more inclusive citizenship model. To understand the tension which has occurred between nature and man as uh, its rational part, as well as to achieve the balance between them, requires knowledge offered by social science and humanities. New times call for a new paradigm and its establishment requires for the role of social science instead of their silence and blindness. People understand the changes less and less and find it uh, increasingly hard to adjust to them. Globalization has uh, speed up the pace of changes and pushed people in situations where they lose control over their personal plans. Migrations, violence, dehumanizations are all consequences of the changes that we have faced in the uh, century of technological progress uh, and uh, human rights. There are too many contradictions and dilemmas in order for them to be understood in different parts of the world by people uh, rooted in their own cultures and overwhelmed by a lot of personal and local problems. People find it easier to accept the fact uh, concerning space research than to understand what they need to change in their cultural habitus in order to find footing in this accelerated world. The next point is that no education system is adequately performing its duties if it is benefited from only by rich elites. Availability of high quality education is an, uh, an important issue in all modern democracy. Bureaucratized uh, management elites at university all over the world place profit before uh, the research based knowledge in social science and humanities which can raise many open questions. The explanations, the economic roads in sine qua non of development and that because uh, of these IT and technological skills are stimulated through the education system is not enough, since the growth can be obtained in the condition of, of uh, unevenly uh, uh, accessible education. Uh, in many countries, which particular high rate of economic growth, education is uh, unavailable to the poor. This is what's problematic with the development theory based on the GDP per capita. This model generally neglects distribution and favors the state with uh, pronounced uh, social inequalities. This is particularly evident when it comes to education. <coughs> taking, taking into account the nature of information economic states can increase their GDP without paying uh, much attention to uh, distribution and accessibility of education as long as they are ca capable of establishing uh, competent technological and uh, business elites. 
However, can democracy survive in the conditions that entail major inequalities in life chances? Critical thinking, which should be noted by social sciences, would not be an essential part of the education orienting towards economic growth. Freedom and thought among students may be dangerous in the intention to create a cohort of technically trained, obtained workers to execute plans made uh, by the elites with the aim of the secure foreign investment and uh, technological progress in the case critical, uh, 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 sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Finally, the education uh, based on the theories of economic growth looks upon the education in art and literature with disdain, since these do not lead to economic progress. As many uh, university, but also on the other level of uh, uh, education, arts and humanities study programs are being closed. Furthermore, potential earnings of technology and the IT uh, professions multiply exceed those of arts, philosophy, of uh, uh, literature prof uh, professors. All this make us ask uh, uh, ourselves, what is the price of philosophy and how much did Socrates earn? Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and I invite Professor Molnar to continue with the presentation. I think it's your first, yes, according to the program. Do we need this or? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. Uh, my name is Dan Molnar. I am coming from Faculty of Economics, University of Belgrade, and uh, my uh, the area of research and interest besides uh, regional local economic development uh, is uh, energy economics. Energy economics. And uh, something uh, what is um, really actual here in Serbia is uh, creating a new uh, industrial policy uh, for uh, next 10 years. And one of the main pillar of this future industrial policy and industrial development in our country is circular economy and low carbon uh, economy as a basis for sustainable development. So I will use this opportunity to raise, raise these uh, topics and to say some facts regarding, uh, regarding the situation in our country. Uh, the fact is that uh, regarding environmental protection, uh, we're not considered as a priority by policymakers in our country in the previous period. Uh, Serbia is ranked 37th from uh, 32 countries in Europe in uh, previous uh, year, 2018, according to Yale University report. Uh, but uh, there are... Um, two ways in which we are somehow pushed to uh, take these topics uh, in, uh, in our future uh, policy. Uh, chapter 27 for EU accession is an ecological question and we as a Euro EU candidate have to fulfill some requirements from the European Union and uh, the other one is uh, market competition. Uh, our companies, industrial companies, producers, in order to be competitive in international markets should satisfy some uh, uh, rigorous uh, uh, ecological and environmental uh, barriers, let's say. Uh, interesting uh, is that Serbia invested only 0.3% uh, of GDP in the environmental protection, which is uh, less than in the EU and in surrounding countries. Some research is uh, suggesting that it should be four or five times more, which means 1.2 or uh, up to 1.4 or 5% of GDP. Uh, but uh, my point is that it is not only a cost. Uh, we should regard this uh, money as investment, and I will explain later uh, what I mean. Uh, the fact is that in Serbia today, every GDP unit is characterized by higher energy consumption and higher CO2 emission compared to the majority of countries in the region in EU. Uh, industrial production in the country is predominantly based on older technologies, which are major environmental uh, pollu pollutants. Insufficient use of energy for renewable, uh, renewable resources by industrial entities in the country due to 
insufficient financial strength uh, or a lack of awareness and possibilities for implementing uh, new technologies in order to save the energy and to save the resources. For example, recycling rates of plastic in our country in 2017 was around uh, 35 percent, which is much lower than uh, in uh, EU and surrounding countries. Uh, for example, uh, regarding, uh, regarding uh, metal in the EU, it was almost 80 percent recycling rate uh, in our country is where was uh, 46. Regarding glass, uh, in EU it was 74%, uh, in Serbia it was only 36%. Uh, so, as I said, uh, circular economy model, uh, contrary to the linear model, supposed that we use and reuse uh, some, uh, let's say, not, not say waste, but some uh, products which are not the main product of the linear model of uh, production. Advantages of circular economy concept uh, could be, and in theory are, environmental, social, and economic. Uh, later in discussion we can uh, talk about that. I will not uh, uh, in this moment uh, saying anything more about that. But uh, regarding goals in front of our policy makers, today uh, regarding that uh, next decade should be uh, more sustainable than previous decades, uh, saying that we have to reduce the consumption of raw materials and raw, re uh, raw resources to make a low carbon economic growth, meaning a higher rate of uh, renewable uh, energy resources and uh, what according to my personal opinion, on the first place, uh, building a supportive environment for the introduction of a circular economy model. And uh, regarding a supportive environment, uh, today we are here to say something about education. Uh, for example, um, I was in previous months uh, have opportunity to talk with uh, representatives of companies all over the Serbia. And uh, all managers in uh, companies saying that in the country there is not uh, enough awareness of uh, waste management and about possibilities of reusage of uh, and reusing of, uh, of uh, materials. Uh, so, um, something we have to do in uh, next uh, period is to increase the level of waste recycling, increase the degree of wastewater treatment, improving the energy efficiency of industrial and <coughs> energy plants, especially energy plants, and uh, what means energy transition based on renewable energy, energy sources. But for that, uh, it is necessary to have a relevant, a relevant knowledge. The state should support the process of developing education and other programs that contribute to the advancement of knowledge by both the general population and industrial representatives. Also, I think that uh, we have to support uh, the capacity building of scientific and educational institutions to work in the energy sector and uh, also to set the scientific and educational system based on the principles of green, circular and blue economy also. We're today talking about circular economy, but also the green economy concept and blue economy concepts also uh, open the door for uh, much more implementation of knowledge and, uh, and models that we can apply uh, in our, uh, in our uh, business processes. Also the concept of bioeconomy and uh, ecological culture and ecological awareness, it is very important. So today when um, you know, Europe is setting course for a resource efficient and sustainable economy, it means that uh, we have to uh, put uh, the, uh, more attention in developing and transferring in our business models new technologies and processes for the bioeconomy as a base for blue and circular economy models. Uh, then developing markets and competitiveness in bioeconomy sectors and pushing policy makers and stakeholders to work more closely uh, together. Uh, I would like to mention uh, uh, a, researcher, uh, a researcher named by Ginter Pauli. Uh, if you have heard for him, yes, uh, he has a book, The Blue Economy, 10 years, uh, 100 innovations and uh, 100 million jobs. 
uh, which is an uh, example how someone who is a researcher, who is uh, also a professor or uh, teacher, uh, uh, let's say in one book put uh, 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 20 years experience of business models regarding how environmental problems with, uh, are uh, open source scientific solution based upon physical processes common in the natural world to create solutions that are both environmentally beneficial and which have financial and wider social, social uh, benefits. Uh, so um, the, uh, also, the uh, other other uh, main thing in our uh, in our um, circumstances here in Serbia that we really uh, have to um, raise the awareness of the people, uh, households, families, young people, and then uh, on the other uh, as, as the outcome it will come that you uh, have to improve uh, the business models and. Uh, the, the, the production uh, the production as such. So uh, without uh, education and primary level, and in the other hand, uh, possibilities that offers uh, actual industrial revolution, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, regarding the, let's say, building the potential to use uh, knowledge and innovations in uh, existing uh, processes in order to save the energy and save the resources because uh, Serbia is not a uh, rich country, as uh, in, during the previous p period uh, we learned in schools. Uh, unfortunately, it is not like that, so we have to have in mind that uh, and uh, to implement the, 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 these potentials I was talked about uh, in, our, in our future industrial uh, policy and supporting the business model in the, in the future. So for the introduction, uh, I do not know if I have used my six, seven, eight minutes, but I'm, uh, I'm uh, here to discuss with you if you are interested for more for and go deeper in some details regarding the existing uh, position and uh, future possibilities for building circular economy model in Serbia. And I have to conclude with my personal opinion that I am uh, uh, also uh, not, uh, I'm not believe too much that we can in next 10 years make some uh, great progress here in Serbia because as I mentioned the figures we are on the very, very low level but uh, we have to prepare ourselves for the future, building the knowledge, uh, building the awareness and uh, preparing for some uh, sustainable uh, industrial model, let's say, uh, in, uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Molnar, for your interesting lecture. And the next panelist is our guest from the Netherlands. Netherlands yeah. yes. Okay. There's no general conclusion from this story. It's just my person. That's, uh, okay. Well, let me first introduce myself. Uh, I'm, I'm, does anyone hear me? Is it, is it too loud or? No, it's fine? Okay. Because I hear myself double. Um, let me first introduce myself. My name is Paul Spearns. I'm 68. I'm a husband. I'm a father of two and a grand grandfather of three. Um, that's and recently I retired. <laughs> um, after graduating as an engineer, mechanical engineer, very basic, solid job, I started my professional career at Volvo Car, producer of cars. Um, first on as a specialist, of course, and gradually I grew into management functions. After, let's say, 10 years, five years of management experience, I really I realized I didn't have enough knowledge of human behavior. I, I was head of a department, all clever people, hardworking people, energetic people. There was no lack of money, and we agreed to do great things. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, everything 
everyone had done something, but not what we agreed to. <laughs> and not by exception, but time after time. And that wondered me. How comes this happens? Why do people, <coughs> it's almost if they refused to cooperate. And, and if we talked about it, okay, we, yes, it was a misunderstanding. And we made new appointments and we agreed to leave this room and all go to, go to the right. The only certainty that anyone would go to the right if there was no other way out than to the right. <laughs> that, that puzzled me. And, and um, it even got worse when I was appointed head of quality in Volvo. And at that moment, I was thinking about quality and I realized quality is not just meeting in advanced uh, agreed standards, but also quality is more on, on l let's say, fulfilling implicit expectations that rise afterwards. C quality is, is much on perception. And from perception, I didn't have any knowledge at all as an honest engineer, nor did my colleagues had. Um, that's why I started studying psychology. And studying psychology was for me, in retro perspective, in looking behind, it, it was a treasure house full of very useful information. To quote Kurt Lewin, no, nothing more practical than a good theory. It gave it to me. But entering the university studying psychology, there was no sign like in a train, mind the gap. Ping, ping, mind the gap. Be warned. There was no warning sign in this study psychology. I don't know if it's others in other schools, but the first year, two years of my education, psychology, I didn't understood what they were telling me. It were all regular, normal words, but they had no meaning. I was <laughs> completely lost in, in translating it. And after, after managing that, that problem, managing, minding the gap, I, I, I was very successful. I, I could practice what I learned at school and, and the most the, the most striking thing for me to learn was, first of all, was de-learning. Going back, getting rid of all kinds of ideas I had. Uh, like um, like um, that, that everything is to be calculated in advance. Uncertainty is, is not a disaster. Uncertainty is part of life and you can use it very successfully. Um, so, so I had to get rid of my, my belief in universal truth and reality. I had to accept the importance of language. Language creates truth. Language creates meaning. And that, that was, for me, striking. But at, in, in time, I learned to do it. W what was even more striking for me is that, that having a shared meaning was even the most important and that a shared meaning, a social construct, can be constructed. And that was helpful for me as an engineer. Of course, constructions, I knew something about. What, what I gained was, was tools for, for better understanding, what, for understanding that every coin has two sides, a, a predictable and an unpredictable side. And that what was really meaningful for me. After learning this, when I was 50, I moved to Rijkswaterstaat. Uh, Rijkswaterstaat is, what you told me, is, is uh, the organization in, in, in Holland, in the, in the Netherlands, that's on behalf of Dutch government in charge of water quality and quantity, protecting us from flooding, uh, taking care of enough uh, drinking water of good quality, and for the main infrastructure. Bridges, dikes, roads, weirs, uh, whatever you, you, you call them. Uh, Rijkswaterstaat is a very robust organization, founded in 1792, meaning it was a merger in 1792 from a lot of local organizations, and the organization is, is even older than the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, it's an organization dominated by engineers, so I felt very at home. <laughs> yeah. What I learned 
again at, at Rijkswaterstaat was what I learned also in my study psychology on the both sides of the coins, that, that a drag, a bridge, or whatever, not just is a solid mechanical construction. It is also a social alteration of an existing organism. What, what is hel helpful to one side of the coin is not necessarily also helpful to the other side of the coin. L let, me, let me give you an example. Th there was a... Um, there was a problem with a highway in a, in a very densely populated area, uh, a, lot of, a lot of noise. So, so what we did is we made a ditch, put that highway down in that ditch, put a roof on it, and we had a highway in a tunnel, no disturbance from noise. Two sides of the road, two neighborhoods, very happy, at least that's what we thought. Problem solved, we can go home. But unfortunately, that wasn't so. Wh one side of the road was a very prosperous uh, neighborhood. High house prices, wealthy people, etc., etc. The other side, night. And on that, on that roof of that tunnel, we created a park with trees and grass and, and anything. And that meant the two sides, the two neighborhoods that never were interacted were connected at a certain moment. And that had a very, very strange, for us, surprising effect. The, the planning for the tunnel construction we did in a, in a time of recession. W the, the work was carried out at the moment that the economy was booming. And booming economy in the Netherlands mean house prices. Meaning that the people of the richer part could easily move to the, through the park to the other side and they could afford very cheap houses and very low rents, meaning that the people living in the cheap houses were pushed away. So instead of solving a sound, a noise problem, we drove them away from their own houses. But wh what problem did we solve? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, th th that's again an ec example. And, and that even was worse for us. Because we are working on behalf of Dutch government, we are, that means we are civil servants. But at that moment, we literally didn't serve society. We disserved them. And on the other hand, of course, it's not good for the social support of our organization. If they come, you can leave your house. That, that's the story we told them. <coughs> uh, that's again at, at two sides of one, of one metal one easy, predictable site, the, the, the construction, and one, in, for us, unpredictable site, the effect on house prices. And, and what I realized at that moment and before also is that there are not only two sides of the coin, there are a lot of sides of the coin. W one is just the construction site, and the other is the, is the house prices site, but there's also financial side, and the legal side, and the political side, and, and the whatever y you can call it, because every construction is, is an intervention in a, in, a social, in a social organism, and especially at this moment when, when finances are short, also in the Netherlands, you, you bring in all kind of, of other consortia financing it, and, and that gives you new, new information. So, what to do? How to deal with predictability and unpredictability? And can it, yeah, and what can you do with it? Um, and, and for the future, we see more and more of these things. So we, all, all the things are, that are called here today, today are also going for Rijkswaterstaat, uh, climate change. Climate change means climate is doing other things than we did the last years. And that for an organization that's building dikes for hundreds of years have to rethink of their way they do it. And at, with the last 20 years, we are experimenting with not building dikes, but with removing dikes, giving land back to the water. That's a big step for the engineers that are trained in building dikes. But it's even a larger step for the people living there. Suppose you're living nicely on the side of the river or on the coast, and at one day there's an engineer knocking at your door and he's telling you, sorry, sir, but you have to remove. We are flooding your property. Yeah. 
how to explain that in a decent way. That, that's not easy. A, a, a lot of these things, autonomous driving, uh, smart d data, data analysis, it, it, it does a lot to our organization. And how do we learn to, these, to, to, do, to do all these things? Who, how do we learn to see all kind of sites on one coin? Okay, then as a, as a last, yes, it's my last uh, remark. When preparing for this meeting, um, a, a dear friend wrote me a mail and asked me, and I'll quote what he said, what kind of initial education in engineering would have prepared your career and what initial education of social scientists would help them prepare to prepare for collaborating with engineers? It's a, it's a very legitimate question. And I really was thinking about it. But honestly, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I don't know. I even, if my, I even asked myself, would it for me personally have been possible to do so? And the answer must be no. When I was 20s and, and I started my engineering education, I wasn't vulnerable at all for social science. It was way too complicated. It doesn't help you. Why should you bother for doing it? It, it was a matter of maturing before maturing and seeing real problems that engineering couldn't help me, that I was able to, to make the mental shift to changing it. So, so I guess, and, and the two educations were complementary for me. There was no overlap. It were two completely different educations on a different language. So I guess I have to rephrase the question to what kind of education can speed up maturing and open someone's mind for the other side of the metal? And even more, wh what can help speaking two languages? Because that's the problem. And putting an interpreter, a translator in between doesn't help in my opinion. No, I, I'm an engineer. And an engineer says, if, if you need a support construction for something you made, you made something wrong. So stop support constructions. And, and a translator is a, is, a, is a support construction. You have to, at least one of the two has to speak the language of the other. I hope you can answer this question for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, then you share mm -hmm. this very interesting and disparate mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> speeches and I think very useful for the mm -hmm. social scientists. Yeah. <laughs> and our last panelist is Professor Urošević. So uh, it would be very hard to speak after such a great speaker like Pao. So, so, but I uh, wanted to confirm uh, his words in some ways because I started with the absolute uh, this this interest in social sciences, uh, I was a physicist, went to the special school in mathematics here, I went to Moscow studying theoretical physics and all that. I was sure that I'm gonna do physics all my life and then uh, after I got my PhD, I realized I'm actually interested in other things and I wasn't sure <laughs> what it was. So I took one year and I took one year uh, under the influence of a friend of mine who was a Japanese professor at Brown where I did my PhD in physics and I took actually one year of economics and I really got interested in that and then I ended up in a consulting firm in Chicago and I worked there for a couple of years and I got interested in a business world and then I said okay well why don't I do another PhD so I ended up getting a PhD in finance and uh, then I realized basically after all of that that I will keep learning you know I th thought at the beginning that as a true theoretician, I should never use a computer except to type a paper, that I should never do programming because this is for those who cannot solve things, you know, in closed <laughs> formulas. And then, you know, I realized later on that programming is maybe the most fascinating thing. And so the past seven, eight years, I was just doing a lot of programming. And I'm teaching economists how to program and solve economic problems using programming. So, you know, it's hard to predict what your own life is going to look like, especially somebody else's life. And what you need now, I mean, who the hell knows what we need 40 years from now? I mean, not for us, but, you know, what, what kids now need 40 years from now. So one thing is for sure, it is very uncertain. And uh, now what I'm doing lately, 
uh, I'm still doing economics, but I got very much interested in artificial intelligence from a particular perspective, actually humanistic perspective. We are looking into the natural language processing and understanding of language, so a little bit connection to this, but we are trying to formalize this understanding of language. And uh, there is a group of us, of which there is a psychologist and uh, sitting in this room here, and then there is me, and there are a bunch of other very clever people of different walks of life, and only some of them are programmers, and many of them are some very different uh, professions. And uh, basically, uh, what we have been doing, we have been trying to figure out how to build the systems that can develop cause and consequence uh, type of statements and semantic question answer systems and so on. So let me explain a little bit why this is interesting. Like we all are using Google more or less or some equivalent to Google all the time and yet this is based not on semantic search, it is based on keywords. And in the keywords you can have for example a horse and a mare which are semantically obviously extremely close, they are kind of husband and wife, uh, to be completely different, uh, basically unrelated concepts. And so what we are trying to figure out how to actually talk about semantics in this sense. So it is building on, s on some ideas that have been in development since uh, 2013. And actually Google was starting with this and now we take, took over some of the stuff they were doing and they moved on to something that we think is a, a little bit a misdirection. Uh, and so we are trying to build up uh, the following system. So um, when we think about the semantics, this is important to understand what we are doing. We are trying to map from one set of objects let's say words, which are actually not so well defined because we have dictionaries, but dictionaries explaining words in terms of other words, and then those words in terms of the other. So they are kind of circular explanations of words. And then there is the, uh, the notational semantics where we talk about concepts such as concept of chair, the concept of table or whatever. But we are, we are interested in is this distributional semantics. So in other words, how are words used? In which context are they used? and what, uh, what words are used with which other words and this helping us understand the words and then somehow do something mathematical with them which I'm going to describe, which is going to be quite helpful, it seems to us. So, for example, you can ask a question, so what is the likelihood that some word comes after the word the in English? It can be anything. It, it's impossible to predict. But if you have the word costa, well, it can be probably only something that is related to some name if it is with a capital C, so it can be some Spanish names of, of various uh, beaches and so on. It can be Costa Cafe that was working here, but there is a much smaller number of possibilities. And then if you take, for example, the word Rica, with R I C A, there is only one word in English dictionary that comes with it before, which is Costa Rica. So uh, not everything is unpredictable. And so what we are trying to do is to map the words into vectors in a sufficiently large space of dimensions and in such a way so that basically these vectors have very small angle with each other so they're very close provided that these are semantically close concepts. And uh, it is kind of remarkable <coughs> that that can be done. I mean this is weird. And we, when you get it you still don't believe it. So the number of meaningful combinations is huge but it is not infinite. It is wrong to think that it is in. And so actually it turns out about three to 400 dimensions can be enough and we have some algorithms of what should be the right type of dimensions. And so the algorithm works like this. So we are talking about words, they are appearing uh, in text, we need to take a whole lot of words and then we are trying to maximize the probabilities that words that come together, briefly speaking, not too far from each other, are actually appearing, uh, you know, close by. And so then we basically parameterize this kind of model by uh, mapping each of these into these vectors. And so now, for example, what was surprising when you take the vector for the word king and then you literally subtract the vector for the word man and then you vector add the vector for the word woman, you get the vector which is extremely close to the word queen. And uh, then you can say, well, what we get is we get out of this huge corpus, we get a unique representation for each word of the corpus. Now you can say, well, how can this be? Because uh, uh, you have mentioned 
that there are so many ways in which we can understand words. And it's so here, for example, the word bank. What is a bank? If you just say bank, it can be anything. It can be bank shop in basketball, can be you know, uh, blood bank, can be bank account, can be all kinds of stuff. Well, it turns out this is the clue. The clue is when you start adding more vectors, in other words, adding more words, you get more and more, you're kind of converging more and more towards a smaller and smaller space in this vector space that is more and more particular what the meaning is. So, for example, you can start with the word bank, then you add the word account, then you word, add the word internet, and you're getting actually much more precise. So that is the very simple concept. So you can actually use this to create things like question and answer systems. So you, we can start with a sentence like Belgrade is the capital of Serbia. It consists of these words. We know the vectors for each of them. You can create, <laughs> you know, put together, you sum up the vectors, you get the vectors for the sentence, and then you subtract the word Belgrade. So what you get is, is the capital of Serbia, okay? Then you add the word what, a vector for that, and then you get what is the capital of Serbia, but you know the answer. So you can do that with objects, with predicates, and so, so on. And you can create, if because you map each word, into a particular vector, not independent of on the content, basically uh, you can get the question and answer system that can be very fast and scalable. And this is something that we are currently having a working prototype. So, uh, but there are issues. So lots of the work done in this area is done in English. So all these texts are typically in English. The, the crawling internet is, to the most part, it is text in English and so on. But there are so many other languages. There is Dutch, there is Serbian, uh, Croatian, whatever. Uh, turns out that in Croatia and Slovenia, they are working on computational linguistics of the Serbian language, including Cyrillic Serbian language, but not here. So our group is considering actually probably at some point dealing with it. But since we are starting, we have started with English because this is the easiest to get the raw materials. It's an important issue. It, uh, so one broader issue would be the following. So the humanistic sciences cannot be separated from these technologies or from the natural sciences. There is no way in which you can do it in any natural way. So basically all these separations are kind of artificial. And so we need to learn from each other we are benefiting certainly with the knowledge of people who are not computer sciences or whatever, because like uh, none of us are linguists, unfortunately, so we need to talk to more, but we have people who are experts on the language in other aspects. And so we need all these different knowledge types to understand things. And this is true probably of pretty much any area. And one of the things that we want to develop, which is also, there is a working prototype for that, is this reasoning graph, which basically you ask a question and then it can give you very, why something happened. And then based on kind of having this co accumulated knowledge, world knowledge from the internet, vi which is continuously being told and parsed, what we get is basically this various statements which says this happened because of that and this ha that other thing happened because of this and so on. And you can assign certain probabilities or what of these explanations make sense. But this obviously can revolutionize the way we think because it can force us to really hone uh, more our critical thinking because you get some kind of benchmark ideas, but then you can ask yourself, you know, whether this makes sense and so on. So you can do a lot of things with it. Obviously, it is not going to do your thinking for you, but it's going to give you a bunch of interesting <laughs> stuff to work with. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Professor Urošević. And now I'm sure that you have many questions, remarks, and but we have only 10 minutes. And please start. You were, you were the first. So I'm, my name is Chen Yihen from Shanghai. Uh, I just want to make a comment on this uh, Gunther Pauli's uh, Blue Economy, which is also very much, uh, I, I translated the book in China. And, um, but that book is very successful sold, and we try also uh, use blue economy um, in the university to do something, but that was not very successful. Gunther Pauli's another book series was very successful, that's uh, uh, Fables. Three, he has written 360 
fables on all the economic uh, and all these uh, uh, ecological or let's say in yeah uh, the mimicry biomimicry of of uh, ecology etc cetera, etc cetera. and that 360 books are sold very well and chinese environmental ministry of environment is using that uh, not the education because it's again two, f two different uh, organizations i don't know whether you have this problem or not so education you have to follow the very stri stri stringent uh, laws and uh, legal, le legal terms. But environment, we can use that saying that you have to train, as you said, that awareness of the children and asking questions and uh, looking for solutions. And that was very successful. And nowadays, actually, Gunther Pauli has to tra travel to China, I think, every almost every three months to different uh, small schools you know the fables is attached to the the, uh, the facts and, and and solutions. Then you have storytelling, you have uh, plays, you have songs. So the children are now affecting, but mostly not in the major cities, in the remote area. So that's maybe very interesting to you to uh, to do that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. As I said, uh, I I'm not. Uh, believer uh, in the, these solutions, especially in our country. Why? Because uh, we do not have enough awareness and we do not have enough knowledge uh, how to make the things uh, in order to uh, save the resources and save the, 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 the energy. And then uh, in order to implement a possible solution, we have to have a, a, a better perspective, yes. It's working, no? It's working automatically. Okay. So just just to help you, because I need a clarification from your presentation, and it is somehow related to to your remark. Are you suggesting? I mean, your circular economy, that we have to get rid of our coal? That we all our strategies are for hundred years that we have coal and it is of low quality. And this is a disaster for our environment. This is all we know. So we don't have the lack of awareness. We, we have that. We only don't know how. How we can uh, just say, OK, we don't need coal because it is, uh, I mean, it is dangerous not only, only for, for, for us, but for maybe for Europe. And, and so do you have any idea to clarify? To no. Uh, but, but this was your suggestion, that we have to get rid of coal. No. Oh. No, it was not my suggestion. I'm very <laughs> aware that we cannot transfer our economy on the renewables uh, so easy because uh, our reserves of coal are very large and all our business processes are based on uh, consumption of coal. I was talking about other, uh, especially waste management, not the energy sector as well, but also the other sectors in which we have... Uh, potential to save and to reuse the all other resources, not just the energy and the coal, which is very, uh, let's say, in our country, uh, you cannot change with uh, water energy, with uh, wind energy, with solar energy, so easy. We 20% um, of renewables in our energy consumption, industrial and household, are the goal we, I'm not sure, can uh, reach. So I predict that in the uh, next uh, 30, 40, 50 years, we will use the coal as, uh, as a primary energy, energy source. Sorry, the I'm Dwight Reed from Los Angeles. A question for Bronco. Uh, in terms of the, the model you were showing, in terms of being able to establish what word connections go together, what it made me think about is sort of strategies that one uses in artificial intelligence. Remember, in the early days with attempts to do translation, the idea was to have artificial intelligence learning, as it were, the grammar of a language and trying to understand translation in a way that humans would be doing translation, but was not very successful. Then Google came in and came up with a very clever way of doing it. It doesn't require any, is not trying to do that in the slightest. 
And so it raises the question of whether, whether the goal of artificial intelligence is can we mimic what humans are doing by a method that may be totally unrelated to in fact what human minds are doing? Or is the goal to try to say, can we understand human intelligence and should we be constrained and then be operating with models that have some plausibility as representing perhaps what humans are doing? If you could just comment on that sort of, you know, those two sure. different strategies. Yes, so I think that uh, different people have probably different understanding of what should be the right goal. And I think all of these are completely valid because, you know, you can maybe find something very fruitful in different directions. So our goal, the way I see it, is to understand uh, like how to aggregate in a way the human knowledge uh, in the most efficient way so that we can come up with the actionable ways that would be improvement with respect to say what is currently state of the art in uh, looking for information. But so it can go beyond. We can look for the basically ways to reason or answer some complex questions that basically an individual could not actually do because you can only have a, a limited knowledge as a human being, but as a collective of human beings, we have a lot more knowledge. And so, and the internet basically, and other sources, but internet in this case, aggregates a lot of this knowledge. And so this is the thing. So how to most efficiently disaggregate back and find a way to connect this information. So that's the, so it's not exactly mimicking one human brain. I, I don't think that would be the way to achieve it. But it's one way, and there are probably other very good ways which can be very useful. Chinese actually have, Chinese have actually um, the biggest, Chinese is the biggest em em emitter of carbon dioxide, you know that. Basically worldwide is 42 billion tons of carbon dioxide next year and China will ex uh, thereof is uh, 12 billion tons. And half of that is coal-fired power station. So what we do here, you talking about the solution, is trying to uh, s isolate c carbon dioxide and then use hydrogen to uh, make uh, methanol. And hydrogen comes out electro electrolysis, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, I just try to answer, or try to, 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 to link the problem which you just mentioned. It's actually, you are right, basically all the technology or everything which you have applied once, the technology, you really don't know what will happen. So the assessment of the technological advancement is a question today. And we don't know the result until you do it. That's a problem. Also, Cup of Rome, I'm a member of that. Uh, we think this is most critical now for human beings to have a, a kind of uh, Technic technological assessment, this kind of unit. Um, when you are, you are mentioning about a real, you, you, you as a government, uh, is that a government agency which you do? Is a, uh, and, and you are looking for if what I have done is actually affecting the, 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 the citizen's life. And what we are facing in China is uh, they just do and don't care about our <laughs> reflection reactions at all. Yeah, so it's a little bit different, but still there are risk. And this kind of risk management is not talked in the institutes. For example, the uh, NTU, which I actually oh, have a friend there, risk management, Institute of Risk Management, and these are meant for insurance companies and not for the risk assessment and not actually talking about the humanistic or, or human factors. In the I, I still remember my, my friend told me, Every time when the uh, socialist or social uh, science people come in, we are in trouble. It's a never ending, the discussion. Engineers. engineers are very clear. Yeah. Too clear, too, 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 <laughs> too clear. In, the, in China. And we mentioned on, on road construction and bridge construction. And we mentioned the topic of maintenance. But that was not a topic. No. no. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I'm a 
pray that uh, the time expire and maybe the last short comments or remarks or about uh, uh, the question about the semantics. Um, do you mean that uh, AI can understand or interpret what we uh, communicate by focusing on semantics without syntax? Uh, no, no, no. So, so basically you map the <coughs> words uh, or you can map uh, the whole sentences or even text in such a way that you preserve like you get vectors that are very close if they are semantically close. So in other words, if the texts are about similar things or the words are, have similar meanings, the vectors end up having very small angle with, with each other. Mm -hmm. so that's for what I for mean. a full sentence, yeah. you yeah. still you need a syntax. You can do that for the sentence. You can do it even for, for, we did it as an experiment with Wikipedia text. And so for example, if you take a whole lot of Wikipedia articles and you compare which articles are connected via hyperlinks with other articles, and you separately estimate the angles between the vectors that you obtain by taking the whole text and making it into a vector, it turns out there is almost one to one. So basically those things that are linked by, by meaning to other text by hyperlinks, they are actually also semantically, they are close with the vectors in the second case. So it seems to work remarkably well and nobody exactly knows why it works so well because it, it's a kind of a good idea, but it seems to do a little too good. But this is true also for the computer vision now. I mean, so it can recognize so many things that humans cannot do anymore. But the difference is this one is totally unsupervised. So basically it doesn't require anybody to tell the computer which what is what. So it does all by itself. but you know, we are kind of, <laughs> we need to know more. Once you do it,